Hello, my name is Aaron and I'm one of the sailors here at Jamestown Settlement. We're here today to continue our series on 17th century navigation. Thomas Blundeville, uh, an English author who wrote about navigation in the 1590s, defined navigation as how to govern or, or direct a ship from one port to another safely, rightly, and in the shortest time. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about a specific form of navigation used in the 16th and 17th century, and that is dead reckoning. Dead reckoning navigation is keeping track of what direction you've sailed and how far you've gone in that direction, um, and so you can figure out where you are relative to where you were. The first tool that's going to be most important in um, determining your course or your direction is the compass. Now, even in 1607, the compass is an old tool that's been around for hundreds of years, um, and we think in Europe it dates back to at least the, the 12th century. Um, this particular style of compass is called a box compass. And you notice it's in a box, which offers it some protection, which is nice when you're on a ship rocking back and forth. And it also has these gimbals. So as the ship rocks, it's going to stay relatively flat and it's going to be easier to read. Um, now this compass is a, a magnetic compass, so it has a magnetic needle that it's going to line with the Earth's magnetic field and it's going to point north, or at least it's going to point to the magnetic north. And it's slightly different than what true north is, and even in 1607 they do know about this difference called magnetic variation, and a good navigator can take account of that um, and figure out where actually um, true north is if they, if they do um, all the, the appropriate calculations. Now this compass, you'll notice, doesn't actually have that magnetic needle in a visible location. Um, it is taped or glued to the bottom of the card. Um, so that way this whole card is going to rotate and turn and that's going to make it easier to read when you're um, you're on, on on that ship. You don't have to line up the card with the with the needle in the correct fashion, just the whole card will rotate. Um, they even write about sometimes having uh, night compasses they can use that are just in black and white, so when they're using those at night that has a higher contrast and it's easier to read. So this is a tool that has been designed um, for use on ships um, and has everything that a sailor is going to need. You'll notice that the top of our compass here has this symbol, the fleur-de-lis. The fleur-de-lis is what uh, re will represent north um, on in any ship's compass in, in this time period. And no matter what country you're sailing from, you're going to recognize that the fleur-de-lis represents north. So even if some of the sailors on board the Susan Constant in 1607 didn't know how to read and write in English, if they're from different uh, countries, if they're illiterate, they will know that the fleur-de-lis represents north. And that means the Maltese cross over here is going to represent east. And from those two points, they should be able to figure out all 32 points of the compass. John Smith uh, wrote that it would be uh, as young sailors, young boys, would have to go to the boatswain um, every week and they would have to name all the points of the compass. They would have to say the compass to the boatswain. And that's just to make sure that they, they know um, um, how this, this tool works and if they're, they're steering the ship, um, if they're keeping track of their, their direction, that the, they can be relied upon to do that. So if we have here, the Florida Lee represents north. Next point over, that's going to be north by east. Then we got north, northeast, northeast by north, northeast, northeast by east, east, northeast, east by north, east, east by south, or uh, east by south, east, southeast, southeast by east, southeast, uh, southeast by south, south, southeast, south by east, south, south by west, south, southwest, southwest by south, southwest, southwest by west, west, southwest, west by south, west, west by north, west, northwest, northwest by west, northwest, Northwest by north, west, uh, north, northwest, north by west, and then back to north again. Um, so not too hard. You can tell it definitely has a pattern to it, uh, but it's really important as a sailor that you know all 32 of those points. So the compass is the tool that sailors use to figure out their course, but it's also important they know how long they have kept that course. And the tool they're going to use for that is the half hour glass. So this is a half hour glass or a 30 minute sand timer. It is going to take 30 minutes or half an hour for all the sand to fall from the top here to the bottom. Now, many of you have probably used um, some, uh, sand timers before, and you'll know that for a sand timer to, um, to actually be um, accurate, you're going to have to be watching it. You're going to have to be paying careful attention. 
So if I don't see that last grain of sand fall from the top to the bottom, I really don't know how long ago a, a half hour was. So it's really important with all of these tools that we're talking about that the sailors know what they're doing and they're paying careful attention. You have to be watching your compass and making sure you're actually staying on the heading you think you're on. And you're going to have to be um, paying attention to your sand timer and that you know when that last grain of sand is falling because you're using this for navigational purposes and you're also using it to keep track of your watches to know how long you're going to be working on board the ship. So the next piece of the dead reckoning puzzle is going to be distance. They need to know how far their ship has gone, how much they have traveled. Now they don't really have a great way of measuring that distance directly, but something they can keep track of is their speed. And we've seen with the half hour glass, they're keeping track of how long they've been traveling. So if you have your speed and you multiply that by the time you've been traveling, you will get the distance that you've traveled. So the tool they're going to be using to, to estimate their speed is called the log and line. It consists of this log or spool of rope um, with a line wrapped around it. And then you have this chip that you're going to throw into the water. The chip has a lead weight attached, so it's going to sink down vertically into the water. The water resistance will hold that in one place um, while the rope comes unspooled. Then they would take a 30 second sand timer, a smaller uh, sand timer, and they would flip it over um, and you would see how much line goes off the ship in that 30 seconds. Just in the water. Turn. Turn. Almost there. Time. Now what you could do is then catch the line at the end of the 30 seconds. You can measure out the fathoms, so about uh, six feet in your arm span, um, and see how much line has gone off the back of the ship. Uh, because you measured for 30 seconds, one 120th of an hour, you multiply however many fathoms you get by 120, and then you know how many fathoms you've gone per hour, and then you can convert that to miles, um, or nautical miles, and they would know how many nautical miles per hour they are traveling. Um, so that, you notice that requires a lot of math. Um, there's a, a, a method that described a little bit later, so may or may not be doing it in 1607, and it simplifies things a bit by actually tying knots into the line. Now, these knots can be spaced at regular intervals. That would be 1 120th of a nautical mile. Um, and then um, if you do that for count those for 30 seconds, the ratio is going to cancel out and you get nautical miles per hour just by canceling your knots, um, or just by counting your knots. The uh, um, nautical mile back then is a little bit different than the nautical mile today. Um, it has the same definition. It's uh, one minute of latitude or one sixtieth of a degree. Now, because their estimation of the Earth's size is different than our, our, uh, our calculation of the Earth's size today, their nautical miles closer to 5,000 feet. Today, we would say it's 6,076 feet um, or 1.15 of a, a land or statute mile. Um, but their uh, because they used to count these knots tied into this line, that's why we call nautical miles per hour knots today. Um, now, Henry Mainwaring, he does say that this, this method using the log and line is a way of uh, no certainty. Um, so it's it, you can tell that this is going to be um, a very... Um, very inconsistent. It's just going to depend on what the the tide, uh, the currents are doing. So if the chip is moving with your ship, you're actually um, moving fa uh, uh, faster than your your chip log is going to tell you. If the chip is moving away, you're moving slower than it's going to tell you. Um, but this is going to give you a rough estimation of how fast your ship is traveling. So the sailor who is ultimately responsible for navigation on the ship is the navigator or the ship's master. Now Henry Mainwaring in his book about sailing in the time period writes that uh, the master could not watch the wind so well as the, he at the helm. Um, so the helmsman, the person who's steering the ship, he is the one who's actually going to be re uh, recording all of this information so that the navigator or ship's master can use it. 
Now, as we mentioned earlier, when we were talking about the sand timer, the, uh, the half hour glass, you can't necessarily rely on all of your common sailors on English ships in the time period to know how to read and write. So they can't just keep track of all this information in a logbook. Instead, they're gonna use this tool right here. This is called the traverse board. Now you may recognize the top part of our traverse board here. This is the compass rose. So the same symbol we found on our compass face. But instead of having a magnetic needle, um, this traverse board's compass rose has these little pins and these holes. So we still have the Florida Lee at the top representing north, the Maltese cross representing east. And from that, we can figure out all 32 points on our traverse board. And the first half hour, the first time that sand timer runs out, we're gonna take one of these pins and we're gonna mark which direction we've sailed. So if we went north the first half hour, we'd put the pin right there. Um, then we change directions. We start going north, northeast the second half hour, we're gonna count out two holes and put the pin right there. So every half hour of our four hour watch, we have eight pins. We're just gonna keep track of what direction we've been traveling. Now down here, we want to keep track of our speeds. So that's what we figured out estimating using our log and line. So this top line, that is the first half hour of your watch. Um, so this, this one can record up to nine nautical miles an hour. That'd be pretty fast for one of these ships. Um, so you, if you went one nautical mile per hour, you'd put the pin there. If the second half hour, uh, wind's really picked up, you've got a big gale blowing, um, you're going nine nautical miles an hour, you'd put it there or anywhere in between. So every half hour, we have a record of um, what direction our ship has been sailing and how fast we were going for that half hour so we can calculate our distance. So that first half hour, when we went one nautical mile per hour going north, we know we're half a nautical mile further north of our previously known position. The second half hour, when we were going north, northeast, um, we were traveling nine nautical miles an hour. So we're four and a half nautical miles further north, northeast. So uh, the navigator, once he gets this data, he can sit down with um, some paper, he can record all of that, um, he can also actually plot their course. So they would take something called a divider um, and they could um, figure out um, using their scale on a map or a chart um, how far that distance is, and then they can just kind of walk it out and they'll, they'll make um, points in, uh, from their previous known position to their new position and they, they can figure out where they are. Now you may be um, picking up uh, when we've talked about all of these tools and all the, the measurements that sailors are doing, that this is not gonna be the um, most precise method of navigation. It's certainly not gonna tell you where you are um, the, the same way a modern GPS would today. It's dependent on you every half hour of, on this case, a 144 day journey, recording what direction you've traveled, how fast you're going, um, and then doing lots of math to use that to figure out where you are. There's lots of room for human error. Um, there's, there's compass variation and deviation to take into account. Your log and line doesn't take into account current. Um, you want a good navigator who can take all of this data and get a really good estimate, a good educated guess about where the ship is, but it's not going to be precise. Now, when they're coming to Virginia in 1607, John Smith actually wrote that um, pretty uh, right before when they, they arrived in Virginia, about four days out, um, they had um, thought they were actually nearer land than they were. John Smith said that they had three days past the reckoning and found no land. So according to the dead reckoning of the ships, they thought they should be further to the west, for closer to land than they actually were. Um, so that can show you after you've been sailing across an ocean, um, traveling for 144 days, you can have, you have quite a bit of margin of error. Um, now, the next video we'll have, we'll talk about celestial navigation and how they can figure out um, their um, their latitude, how far north and south they are with a little bit more accuracy. But in 1607, dead reckoning is going to be a sailor's best way of knowing their longitude, how far east and west they are. We hope you enjoyed our video on 17th century navigation, dead reckoning. Um, if you liked our video, uh, please make sure to like and subscribe our channel. And if you have any questions, please let us know in the comments down below.